Welcome to the State of the Union Conference. We are back for more sessions this afternoon. And the next one, we're going to be having a very interesting conversation as the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing trends of attacks against democratic systems, both globally and within the European Union. What kind of cooperation and joint actions are needed and have to be developed at global level to build stronger and more efficient responses. And the moderator for this session is Pietro Ducci, Director General of the European Parliament's Directorate General for External Policies Union. Thank you very much, Sasha, for introducing me. Thank you very much for uh, the organizers of the um, State of the Union to uh, run this panel. And uh, my name is Pietro Ducci, you've just introduced me, so I don't need to do it again. I'm connected from Brussels, although I'm from Florence, but I'm not going to insist on, on that, that I'm not here physically present with you. The title of the panel is How Can Democracy Join Forces to Combat Disinformation and Other Foreign Interference? And why this panel? This panel is very, very timely and very, very uh, at the heart of uh, the work of uh, various institutions and uh, um, academic work. In particular, for us within the European Parliament, it's very important because in this precise month, the Parliament has set up a special committee to fight against foreign interference. By the way, we have the chair of, the, of that committee with us today as a panelist, and I will introduce him a little bit more uh, later on. And therefore, the, the panel is absolutely at the center of the work of the institution, but not only, because I know very well that on the side of the European in, um, University Institute, there is the European Digital Media Observatory, which brings together fact che checkers and academics really to investigate on this fact. So that's very important, and that's um, uh, why we really need to address this topic today. Uh, to discuss uh, today beyond uh, European institution uh, and, uh, and, and European world, the panel is very broad because we're bringing together um, personalities from various sides of the world. And it is my pleasure to introduce to the panelists. First of all, Dr. Kinuko Ingushi, who is connecting from Tokyo, and she's a member of the House of Councillor of Japan, former Minister of State and former Ambassador Professor Emeritus of the Sofia University in Tokyo. We have also uh, Dr. Alina Polyakova, connected from Washington. She is president of the and CEO of CAPA, Washington-based Center for European Policy Analysis, and professor of European Studies at the John Hopkins School and Advanced International Studies. Third panelist, Mr. Glucksmann who is connected from uh, Paris. He's a member of the European Parliament. And as I told you, he is the chair of the Special Committee on Foreign in Interference and Disinformation in the European Parliament. And he is a well-known expert on um, international affairs on trade matters. So thank you very much to the panelists for being here. How are we going to uh, run the panel? In the first part of the panel, it's going to be my pleasure to ask some some questions to the three panelists, which is going to be as interactive as possible. First, uh, small question, uh, direct answers, and that is going to cover the first part. In the second part, as it is the case, the audience will have a chance to ask questions about what they see, what, what is their view on various things, and to ask our panelists what is their answer. So if I can start with the first question, my first question will will be how to qualify malign uh, foreign interference according to the current level of understanding of the phenomenon. Um, when we talk about foreign interference, dear panelists, uh, we know that it can take many forms. It can take the form of political financing, it can take the form of disinformation, it can take the form of cyber attacks. All in all, what kind of form it takes, one thing that I think everybody agrees is that it undermines the, um, the trust of the citizens towards our institution. And this is something that is quite important. With the COVID pandemic, the situation has got even worse. 
And uh, we in the European Parliament are well placed to know that because we've seen the shrinking of pace for uh, transparency and, and uh, democracy values all over the world within the, the COVID um, uh, pandemic. So how would you qualify the phenomenon? This is, uh, uh, is it just a threat? Is it uh, a, a moment or is it something which is ongoing? Is it going towards something becoming uh, regular? Um, Professor, uh, Mr. Stubb yesterday was talking about uh, the line between war and peace is quite blurred. Are we going towards that? There is a lot to discuss there. So can we start from your side with the definition of the phenomenon? I'm happy to give the floor to um, Mr. Glucksmann, who is going to be followed by Ms. Ingushi and Ms. Polyakova. Thank you, Mr. Glucksmann. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, very del delighted to be here. I mean, let me start by, by saying something very blunt and simple. It's that the time of naivety has to come to an end right now. Because as you said, uh, there is no huge clear difference anymore between war and peace. Of course, we are not at war with anybody. But can we say that we are in peace when we are under attack, when our democracies are under attack. And for too long, the European elites have lived in a world that does not really exist. I mean, we were all believing in this gigantic fake news from the uh, 90s, which was called the end of history. And in the recent years, what we have witnessed with these attacks on our democracy is that reality was very different from our dreams and that we had to actually face this reality. That's why we have created an, uh, uh, this uh, INGE uh, committee, Special Committee on Foreign Interference in the European Parliament, is to establish the diagnosis and, and to uh, recommend how to face it, to fight it. Because let's face it, a hybrid warfare has been launched on our democracy from various foreign hostile regime. It goes from disinformation campaigns, which are very different from just simple fake news. It's orchestrated campaigns from abroad to covert operation on funding of political parties in Europe or cyber attacks against critical infrastructure, including against public health facilities during the pandemic, large scale use of uh, capture of European elites, industrial uh, investments that are threatening our sovereignty or uh, control of diaspora living abroad inside the European Union. We all know where these threats come from. They come from mainly from Russia, China, and other hostile regimes. We have to name it and we have to face the dimension of these threats. So I would say that right now we are passing a litmus test. Are we able to defend the democratic system that we inherited from our parents and grandparents? Thank you very much, Mr. Gruxman. Uh, Dr. Ngushi, what is your view about the phenomenon, please? Well, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for having this symposium and inviting me from Tokyo. Um, in Japan, uh, we have very strict um, domestic laws forbidding foreign financing, and we are in the process of coping with uh, possible cyber attack. We haven't had um, very uh, solid cases of um, foreign interferences in electoral process, uh, but uh, it is absolutely important to make our democracies more resilient and make it sure that sovereign citizens have their full right to uh, to participate and to take part in the elections without any foreign interference. So this is a, a very new topic and the new framing of the challenges to democracy. Um, as far as war and peace is concerned, of course, there are many sort of uh, fuzzy zones. Uh, we could be under attack at any time through uh, SNS or or cyber uh, uh, means, uh, but uh, in more traditional terms, I would suggest that nations should not go into wars at this time 
when you cannot control foreign interferences to the process. Um, European Union um, was formed to uh, pursue uh, perpetual peace. Um, I think uh, we should all call to all nations uh, to stop fighting. I mean, we are in the midst of uh, COVID-19 crisis as well. And on top of that, uh, if we are not sure about uh, uh, our capability to um, forbid foreign interferences to our political systems, um, first of all, we shouldn't go, to, go into any real wars. And second, we should try to form an international convention to control and forbid such foreign interferences to a democratic process. We need to cope with the formation of a new international law. Um, so this is a legal response. Also, I would, uh, I would suggest we should put, put more emphasis on education. Uh, we have to educate our, our citizens uh, with this uh, sovereign citizenship um, uh, philosophies. Um, and also, uh, we have to cope with the discrepancies, disparities under the globalization, because it makes it easier for foreign forces to capitalize this discrepancy and come with a populist interferences. Uh, in Japan, we haven't really experienced such um, massive uh, interferences. We try very hard uh, to um, amend uh, disparities, not to create Thank disparities. You. Thank you very much. I'll come back, by the way, on your uh, international response, which is a very valid point. I appreciate that you mentioned that. Uh, Dr. Polakova, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much again for including me in this important discussion. I completely agree with the framing uh, that you uh, started us off with, uh, Mr. Ducci, and uh, with MEP Glucksmann's comment that the reality is that we are living in a gray zone of political warfare. And we haven't quite come to terms as society, uh, as a community of democracies, what that actually means. Our democracies that we inherited from our grandparents and parents uh, were 20th century models of democracies, if not even going further back in history. But we face a 21st century that is a digitalized uh, community of democracies. And that has, of course, opened huge opportunities for more direct communication with political leaders, more direct participation, democratic debates, but it's also opened a lot of opportunities to exploit and undermine our democracies by adversarial states, most notably Russia and China. And we haven't updated our ability to respond to these modern day threats uh, in the same way that our adversaries have developed sophisticated, quite sophisticated tools for interference, whether that be in the information domain, uh, whether that be in the cyber domain, or in terms of using the tools of illicit finance to try to undermine our democracies from within through kleptocratic networks of various kinds. So my point is to say we can respond, but we still are going through a digital revolution. We have not come out on the end yet. Our societies are still being transformed as we speak, and, but we have to start thinking about a proactive approach. The reality is that these non-kinetic gray the zone threats are not going anywhere. This is the reality that we have to live in today. And we cannot consistently be surprised when Russia interferes in a democratic election, uh, when we have Beijing's disinformation around vaccines and COVID-19 launched in our democracies. This is the way of life today, unfortunately. And I find that we haven't started thinking about how do we think in the long term? How do we think about proactive strategy to respond rather than constantly responding to one disinformation attack, another cyber attack here, our adversaries see this as part of their strategy to compete with democracies. And I wanna make it very clear that this is an incredibly uh, pivotal moment. It is indeed a litmus test, as uh, Mr. Glucksmann said. This is a battle of governance, whether democracies will prevail or whether authoritarian governments, gov governance models will prepare and it's critical that we ramp up the pace of our coordination, our collaboration, and work together 
and understand that we have a common challenge here. But I don't think we're there yet, and there's a lot more we need to do. But we, we are getting there. But I think it'd be really useful to talk about some specifics as to what we can do better together in the panel. Perfect. This is precisely the intention I had to come and ask you later on how we can uh, better respond together. Just for your information, while you were talking, we addressed a question, uh, a poll question to the audience. On the question is, on average, how well or badly do you think democratic countries are responding to the challenges posed by other countries seeking to interfere in democratic process? The results of the poll are quite interesting, and I'm happy to share them with you. Nobody says that they don't know. 45% says that the answers are very badly, 35% fairly badly, 20% fairly badly, and nobody thinks that the answer has been uh, very well, and uh, th nobody thinks that the answer has been uh, very well. So uh, that's exactly what you were saying, uh, Dr. Polyakova. So that brings me to the second question, which a little bit you addressed already, but you, you can define it a little bit better if you want, is the way forward on domestic responses. How do you think, from a domestic point of view, first, the answer has been um, provided to that question. And to answer that, I'll first ask you, uh, Dr. Polyakova, if you can develop what you were just saying right now, followed by uh, Mr. Glucksmann and then by Dr. Inigushi. Thank you very much. Alina, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for that follow up. Uh, first, uh, we do need to understand that there is no more line between domestic disinformation or disinformation meaning groups in our own societies who are using social media and other online tools to spread false information and foreign disinformation attempts that are coming from Russia, China, and others. And now we've seen an overlap in the online space between what's happening domestically and how foreign actors are able to use our internal cleavages and divisions uh, to pursue their own strategic agenda to undermine democratic values and principles. But I think very, very concretely, you know, I think there's a short term strategy here and there's a longer term view that we have to take. On the short term, we can directly begin to respond to information influence operations and cyber uh, breaches and cyber operations. We do have the ability to sanction and cut off the financing to specific actors that we can identify through our own intelligence agencies and services who uh, carry out various kinds of interference operations against uh, uh, the United States and, and our allies. I'm coming from Washington, so have a bit of a US view here. Uh, and we have started to do that, but we can do a lot more. We can't just focus on specific individuals that, uh, for example, are uh, typing away uh, various comments in a troll factory in St. Petersburg. We have to focus on the actual networks of finances that are feeding uh, the capabilities of these kinds of agencies to be able to carry out their work. So in the short term, we can start to set up a deterrence, a deterrence against future information threats and cyber operations. In the long term, of course, we need to think about our own resilience as democratic societies. And this has to do with uh, uh, broader conversations with our own citizens so that we don't get stuck in highly polarized groups, which is of course already happening in the United States and elsewhere, and a broader educational campaign that not just focuses on individuals, but focuses on journalists and editors who are writing a lot of stories, who are picking up uh, information. How do you identify uh, misleading information or disinformation? How do you build those digital skills in, the, in this generation, the next generation, to be better prepared for the future? and the reality in which we currently live. So I think we need to think about what are our short-term tools that we currently have, we do have tools, and then what is a longer-term strategy to build resilience uh, to authoritarian influence operations and the spread of disinformation more broadly. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Glucksmann, what is your view on the domestic or uh, maybe European Union sort of uh, answer so far? I'm pretty sure that within the committee, you've been addressing this issue recently. Yes, we have already spent months uh, trying to uh, address this issue, and I am not surprised by the results of your uh, questions and your polls, because, I mean, we only at the European Union level started to act seriously on this matter for two or three years, 
and we are only at the very beginning of our response mechanism. So basically, I want to comment what has already been done. I mean, for instance, when you take Stratcom, uh, the existence of Stratcom it was very successful, but the mandate and the means are so small. If you, if you uh, remember when uh, we hosted uh, the high representative uh, Borel to our committee uh, in the parliament, and we asked him the question about China's interference and, and the means to struggle against it, he responded that basically nobody was working on it, as bluntly as that. So we have an issue here of mandates and we have an issue of means allocated. And, and the same with the social networks. I mean, let's face it, the platforms, there is an issue. We, we are trying now at the European level to tackle, to tackle this issue. And nobody here wants to condemn the platforms per se. I mean, it's not because crazy people wrote books uh, exalting bigotry that we have to punish Gutenberg, that we under, all understand. I mean, we still need books, even if crazy people write books. But we need to come to this reality that now we have a new democratic forum and we don't control it. We don't understand it even. And so there is really, there is an effort now by Commissioner Jourova, for instance, uh, and the Democracy Action Plan to be serious on it, but it's only the start, so it's normal. And plus, Compared to the US, I must say that we have in the European Union a specific issue. We have 27 different regulations on everything. So basically, when it comes to covert operation of political uh, funding, uh, then you have 27 different legislation and you have loopholes everywhere. So in our committee, what we are trying to do is to work on harmonization and how we can create a common European political space if we don't have a common approach to these things. I mean, at the same time, you have a request to have more European space, but how would I even support that as a pro-European figure if I can't say that there is a safe space to debate and that different regulation offers opportunity for Putin to get involved in my election in France through Malta or other countries? I mean, this is very really serious. So, and I fully agree with your, your distinction. There, there's a defensive measure, short terms, and, and there is another aspect, and we can't escape from it, and our committee will focus on that. It's a long term. We are now in a pandemic. We all know that only collective immunity or universal vaccination can allow us to get out from this crisis, yes? It's the same with this information campaign and, and, and aggressions from outside interferences. We need to make our society more immune to these attacks. They won't stop, never. But the, we have to be immune. And it implies the question of public financing of political life and public debate, uh, education, you mentioned it, media literacy, uh, social network literacy. It also involves uh, new ways to help independent journalism. We all know that media's economic models are in crisis now, but a society without independent journalists will be a society governed by, by, by this uh, fake news industry on social networks. So it's a long-term effort. We have very immediate things to do, starting with sanctions and deterrence, but we also have long-term things to do, which is a total reshaping of our democratic life. I mean, it's a mission for a generation. We need new approach to democracy now. Thank you. You are fully right. Unfortunately, I have a mission as a moderator in the moment, and I have to bring the, the panel towards uh, the, the end of uh, our time in, in, in bright time. But you said something which is absolutely fundamental, important. We'll cover that in the third question. One comment on my side. Um, the first resolution on these issues from the European Parliament was in 2016. If we read it today, it looks like middle age comparing to how the evolution is going. So that's covering a little bit, but we'll come back to that. Ms. Ingushi, from Dr. Ingushi, from your side, how do you see the domestic response in, in two words? How do you see that before we cover the third part, which is going to be also super interesting, and also the question from the audience? Please. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, you have to put in place legal uh, regulations forbidding 
uh, foreign financing or any uh, ways to allow foreign interferences to the democratic process. And this really has to do with uh, electoral laws and uh, adapting electoral laws to this era of SNS and online interferences. Um, also, as I said, education uh, would be very important. Also, um, if you have very divisive populist uh, political agenda, it's easy to, um, uh, it, it could be easy uh, for foreign um, powers to interfere. So um, we have to put utmost effort to make sure that you have greater coherence, social coherence, um, integrity uh, within sovereign nation state and uh, not to, to allow populist divisive argument uh, to take the main uh, platform. Also, uh, economic disparities. Um, probably there is a synchronized cycle of economic slowdown and uh, more incentives or more room for foreign interferences. I think scholars must do uh, uh, serious sort of research to find out uh, what are the correlations of foreign interferences. Uh, knowing is the first line of defense against any problems. So um, academia has a lot to do uh, as a domestic response. But in the end, I would uh, um, like to highlight the importance of mission of journalists and editors you see, all these centuries, we worked with editors if you want to publish a book. But with SNS, you can write anything, and fake or real. Um, there's no sort of gatekeepers for uh, the sort of a civilized development of our norms and culture. So um, there are many ways that uh, we have to respond. Of course, uh, we can respond from IT side, how to... Uh, sanction uh, the uh, finances of those fake news. Um, these would be very uh, uh, effective. But in the end, as I said at the outset, uh, we may try to establish a new international law uh, to forbid such uh, action. Uh, international norms, establishment of norms is very important. It's not yet still there. So uh, some countries may, may find it very uh, useful to, uh, to do such an activity. But if you have an international norm established, and that can be done through journalists, through media, but best done through establishment of a new international law forbidding. Thank so you. Many... Thank you. No, super. You, I appreciate that you cover so well the effort of the international or the or the global community, not just politician on one side, journalists on the other, or academic on the other. It's really pretty much a joint effort. And in this respect, you mentioned international. I move to my third question, which is precisely on that. What is the way forward at international level? All of you have been hinting here and there to this. Some of you have also been talking about sanctions. I'd like to hear from you. What is your, your view after we've been uh, describing the phenomenon, talking about domestic responses from an international point of view? And I'll start on that uh, with Dr. Uh, Ingushi, followed by Dr. Polyakova and Dr. And, and Mr. Glucksmann at the end. One just little thing to add for your reflection. We just heard um, High Representative Borrell uh, talking about uh, the difficulty of not creating the word of, uh, on one side, the good community and the other side, uh, the others. How do we assess all that? How do we put everything together? So what is your view on that? I know that the question is quite broad, but if you can focus on the way the international community could answer, mentioning uh, the issue of the sanction, maybe, I'd like to hear from you. Thank you. Dr. Ingushi. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really should continue with what I've been saying. Um, put in place international norms that these need to be forbidden. And in the past, many decades ago, um, 
um, a lot of efforts has been put to create international law to forbid, um, for, for example, a type of weapons. Um, so we can do that with uh, not uh, only weapons, but with these uh, foreign interferences issues. Um, when we do that, when we try to draw up uh, international convention, at the same time, we will be establishing international norms that these needs to be forbidden. But uh, the parties to the convention, if that comes true, um, need to know that uh, we have to cover international assistance because many uh, developing countries probably will not have the capacity uh, to establish uh, the domestic measures to forbid such interferences. Um, in most recent conventions, international laws, uh, there are clauses to uh, highlight the importance of international cooperation. So all democracies needs to be united to make sure that democracies can grow and prosper and serve sovereign citizens and go beyond uh, to provide international cooperation. And if uh, the, the basis of democracies are uh, eroded in such ways and people lose face and the people become victims of uh, populist divisive uh, foreign interferences, I think we lose so much of the basic uh, basis of our of our civilization. Um, so I will stop there. But I hope Euro European Union, uh, in particular, will lead the way uh, because you are at the forefront of such attacks. I'm sure that Mr. Gruxman appreciate the last comment. Thank you very much. It was very very interesting, Dr. Polyakova, from your side, seeing from Washington, how do you see the international response? And uh, what is your feeling about this? Well, to be honest, I think we have to recognize that there is an us and them in the 21st century. And no matter how much we want to include countries like Russia, China, and some others at the table, they don't want to be at the table. And it's I'm not saying that um, uh, coming from the United States, look at everything that we've heard from Mr. Putin since at least 2007. Uh, Russia does not see the world as a community based on common international norms. Russia sees the world as competitive. And frankly, we've seen over and over again how the Kremlin doesn't care to follow international rules and norms. And that is becoming a pattern in other countries as well. So whether we like it or not, and whether we want to divide the world, the world has been divided for us by the, th the very authoritarian states that seek to challenge our democracies. And so to my mind, we do have to build a broader coalition of democracies. I hope that is something this administration in the United States, the Biden administration will do as part of their desire to bring together a summit for democracy um, in the next months, as they've stated. Uh, second of all, I think we need to understand that one of our greatest assets as a democratic community is not just our governments. We have to include a whole of society, multi-stakeholder approach. And even though uh, clearly there needs to be some regulation on the social media companies and other tech sector companies as well, they are not the enemy here. We have to work together with, the, with industry, with the private sector to make sure that we can reach a consensus um, as to how we approach the problem of authoritarian interference in particular. And we, of course, have to include civil society, journalists, researchers as part of that discussion. To my mind, this is the only way that we're going to build a proper coalition. Governments can only do so much. We've seen that. Industry has a responsibility. Individuals have a responsibility. Journalists, independent media have a responsibility. And so we can't leave them outside of this conversation. So I think on the one hand, we need to understand that we are very limited in what we can do in terms of international norms. I think we've seen in very troubling ways how China has thought to revise and completely redo the entire system of international uh, norms around technology. And I think this is the key thing. Whoever controls and dominates in tech innovation today will have the ability to set the international agenda. 
So for us as a coalition of democracies, not only do we need to think about how do we push back and build deterrence, we also need to maintain our competitive edge in the technological arena. Otherwise, this is how we lose the 21st century. Thank you very much. Mr. Gruxman, on your side, how do you see the thing? International response. Thank you. I will start with the end question that you asked, uh, with the sanctions, because I think that there is, there is a reason why, for instance, Vladimir Putin goes, uh, goes on with interfering in our democracies. It's because he doesn't have to pay a price or not a huge enough price to make him think again. And this is showing weakness. So from my perspective, the first thing to do is about political will. It's to show that we are not weak and to make those who are interfering in our democracy pay a price. That's the first thing. Then, of course, we have shared experience. I, I mean, I remember uh, some Europeans having a reaction when uh, we were all seeing the pictures of the Congress being stormed, saying, oh my God, you, you see how crazy Americans are. Uh, and this was a, a, a thinking. And my response was always, but it can happen tomorrow in Europe. I mean, we share exactly the same threats and the same experience. So if we have a summit of democracy coming, then the first point on the agenda should be how do we protect and defend our democracies first, before, before speaking about new international order, new uh, international arena, how do we protect our democracy? We have to establish a common diagnosis, exchange experiences, because there are countries, not the US, not Europe, that have something to teach us. For instance, if you take Australia or Canada, or even Taiwan has something to teach us on that. So, then there is a question on the deterrence issue is that what we have witnessed during the last uh, sanctions against uh, Chinese official involved in the crime against humanity in uh, against Uyghurs is that if we can have common sanction mechanism, I mean, common sanction actions, then it has an impact on, 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 on hostile regimes. And, and that would be a very good thing if during this summit we could discuss about how we coordinate uh, uh, on a systemic uh, approach, this sanction mechanism. Because I, I want people to understand, and sometimes in Europe it's very hard to understand it, that it's not conjunctural. I mean, it's not oh, a difficult moment that will pass. We are in this fight for a very long period of time. And if we take China, for instance, China is not a small issue, and it's not even a foreign issue. It's, a, it's an issue that's here to last for decades, and we are late. It was told just before, but I want to insist on that. If you want to really make our democracy safe, then you have to produce things. You can't be continents of consumers living a life of, of people just being fed by made in China products, and especially when it comes to new technology. We have something in, in Europe that's so important for our future, the Green Deal. You see, we are investing a lot of money in this Green Deal, and we are right. But what's the result? We will feed, if nothing changes, we will feed the uh, production apparatus of China. Everything is coming from that. So we have to uh, now behave like grown-ups. And I think that there is a huge change in the approach of globalization as a whole in the Biden administration and in Europe at the same time. So let's make this change together and with our Japanese friends, our Austrian friends, and first among democracies. That's, that's key to understand. First, we shape our response among democracies and then we try to internationalize it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's super, super useful for the debate. And I appreciate a lot the content of what you said. We've got 10 minutes left and I'd like to pass to the part of the question from the audience. There are many questions. I have to do a very delicate exercise to choose questions. And I apologize for the audience that I will not be able to address all of them. But I've been given already a couple of questions, which I think 
are quite interesting. And I would like to ask them in the next five minutes because I want to leave all of you one minute each to conclude. So maybe I'll go for the first question, which allows me to play a little bit devil's advocate. Listening to all of you, we've been talking about Gutenberg, we've been talking about books. The question is, where is the limit? Where is the line between freedom of expression and fight against disinformation? Do you think there is something that we should define better? Can you answer in one minute each, maybe uh, all of you to this question, if you think appropriate, who wants to start? Dr. Poliakova, please. Well, I'm, I'm happy to start. Of course, this is a question that comes up quite frequently. Um, first of all, I think it's very clear that when we talk about online content, we have to apply similar rules as we have applied to written, printed content for a very long time in our societies. There's clearly illegal content and you know, child pornography, extremist videos of violence that we don't want in our public sphere. But what we're really talking about is everything else in the middle. Uh, things that are not uh, explicitly illegal in that way. What do we do uh, when someone or something uh, is putting information out there that is misleading, uh, that could be false, uh, that is uh, trying to perhaps sway a certain opinion or opinions that we just don't like necessarily to, to, to be confronted with in our societies. And I think we haven't found a balancing act here yet. Of course, we should never become the authoritarian states we seek to outcompete, meaning we should never move too much into censorship. We have to preserve freedom of expression and freedom of speech in our societies. On the other hand, clearly uh, we need to put some guardrails around what is acceptable uh, speech freedoms online. And it was really interesting just a few days ago in that context to see this Facebook oversight board make his decision about the a Facebook account of the former US president, uh, President Donald Trump, which of course social media platforms banned after his uh, supposed support for the attack on the US Capitol in Washington. Uh, and so far we don't have a set of clear guidelines. So I think we're still trying to figure out what that balance is, but we're having the debate now. And I think that is the important element here. But I think we need to really veer on the side of freedom of expression and freedom of speech and be very, very careful that we don't go too far into restricting free speech online. But again, here, this is where governments have to play the critical role to give very clear mandates and to regulate companies that are private firms. We have private companies now controlling the public sphere. And so we need to give them the kinds of regulatory frameworks and guidelines and guardrails to give to, uh, to, that will better protect our democracies in the long term. And we're not quite there yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, in particular, thank you for mentioning the social media, which was also another question which we are addressing as an answer without asking the question. But indeed, the question was there. How can we how can democratic countries uh, mm, prevent disinformation via social media, what are the issues that should be done? And you have already answered to that. Uh, Dr. Ingushi, it's your, 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 turn to, your time to re answer to this question about freedom and uh, disinformation, please. Well, freedom of speech is the basis of our democracy. So we have to protect this freedom of expression of speech. But this is very different from trying to interfere in foreign electoral process of foreign citizens um, with fake and this uh, information means. Um, so this is uh, a completely different uh, set of questions um, and we have to frame it in such ways. You cannot um, use this idea of freedom of speech to legitimize for interferences to democratic process. And at the same time, you can't use for interferences as an excuse uh, um, uh, to uh, protect the freedom of speech. Uh, so we have to protect freedom of speech, but you don't do that. Um, as a means to intervene in uh, democratic process of other countries. Thank you very much, Dr. Inogushi. Um, Mr. Glucksmann, on your side, how do you see this, uh, this limit between the two? 
You know, at, at the very beginning of, of our committee, I really, when you had the debate in the parliament, I really insisted that foreign interferences will be put forward and disinformation will be put uh, after. Why? Because I don't think we should struggle against uh, the fact that people might believe that uh, basically the earth is flat. I mean, we, we know from ancient Greeks that opinions are, 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 are relative, you know, you, you, you don't have a, a truth that's absolute and you have a discussion and the democracy is all about this dissensus, even including on very uh, basic principles. But there is a difference between believing that the earth is flat and saying it and having a foreign government orchestrating on your soil, even if it's virtual, a campaign to make sure that people will believe that the earth is flat. And, and, and the difference is there. If you have an orchestrated campaign, then you have an attack. And that's not just that people might be misled, it's that there is an organization of a, 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 a gigantic misleading of people. And, and then there is this uh, question, I mean, this key question that the committee is working on, it's, it's to make sure that basically we don't touch uh, freedom of expression. But how you do that? Then you educate people. You, you put money and means and thinking on how you can educate people to make a good use of this new uh, means they have to communicate. And, and, and really, Gutenberg is a good example because, uh, you know, Gutenberg, it brought enlightenment, it brought uh, a more free and more open debate, but it brought also uh, religious wars. It brought also uh, a, a civil war of Europe killing thousands, hundreds of thousands of Europeans because of, of bigotry that was widespread through books. So every okay. new forum yeah. is, is a threat and an opportunity. And it just depends on us to make it an opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Grossman. And it's uh, fully right uh, what you're saying. I, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, dear panelists, uh, three minutes left. Less than one minute each to pass a very tough and precise me message to finish the question. Dr. Inoguchi, what is your last message, please? Knowing is the first line of defense. So we have to know that democracy cannot be taken for granted. Democracy is always under threat. And we have to make sure that with our generation democracy will develop and uh, deepen. I was once a board member of an in, institution called International Institute for Democracy and uh, Electoral Assistance. It's called IDEA. It's uh, headquartered in Stockholm. So there are international organizations. This is intergovernmental organization, but there are many NGOs that help democracy grow um, globally. Um, Thank you. Probably. Thank we, you very much. Knowledge is a very good uh, word and it's a, a very um, precise question. Dr. Polyakova, on your side, key message for the end, please. Well, first of all, I think we have already come a very long way in over the last six years um, since I've been working on this issue in building a consensus and a collaborative understanding, but we have a lot more to do. And I think we haven't quite hit the moment where we're over that hump, if that makes sense. We, we still have, I think, years ahead of us, but we're not going to feel like we are winning this battle. But I think we have to see the light at the, at the end of the, at the tunnel, which is that history has taught us that people want to live in free societies. They don't want to live in authoritarian states. So any or any government that sees itself as pushing a third chain model in the end will not win. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Glucksmann, on your side, tough message to close the panel. Yes, I, 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 will, I will conclude with a, a, quoting a poet, uh, Hölderlin, a great German poet, wrote, where the danger is also uh, grows the saving. And I think that this threat is a tremendous opportunity to revitalize and, and, and reshape our democracies. We were thinking that it was a given 
forever, that we inherited democracy, then we will live all our life in democracies without fighting for it. There is no democracy without fighting for it. And now it's time for us to show that we are actually ready to fight for our democracies. Good. <laughs> thank you very much. That's a, a super good conclusion. I really thank our three panelists. I thank the audience. I apologize for having to be a little bit tough, but that's the role of the moderator here and there. From my side, a small conclusion, I would say a word, work in progress. There is a lot to do, and we will definitely see each other again, uh, hopefully physically for a next um, occasion like this one. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the State of the Union. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.